Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This is February 25, 2022. And we are going to take a look at the similarities and contrasts between Moses and Paul. A lot of people may not know this. However, names in the Old Testament and oftentimes the New Testament as well have meanings. So let's go take a look at what Moses means. So get your King James, turn it to the book of Exodus, chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, Pharaoh had decreed, you know, the, the king of Egypt had decreed that all the male boys, well, all the males born to Israel were to be killed. Let's throw them in the Nile. Well, you ever heard of a Nile crocodile? A newborn baby would barely be a snack for a, you know, I don't know how much, how, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds or how many hundreds of kilos they weigh or whatever, but uh, they weigh, they're big. And uh, so his parents kept him for as long as they could. And then they put him in a reed, like a reed boat, and uh, waited until Pharaoh's daughter was at the Nile in the river uh, washing and floated Moses their way. And of course, God's hand was in on the deal. So, in Exodus 2.10, and the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. So Moses basically means to draw, or to draw out, you know, bring out. Not sure about the water part. Now, you... Uh, let's see. One more thing I better bring up real quick. She brought him up out of the water. Is that symbolic? Well, let's take a look. All right. Remember this. Waters. You know, water, H2O, wet stuff. Yeah. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, talked with me, saying... Come unto me, uh, saying unto me, come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The judgment of the great whore which sitteth upon many waters. Many waters. Keep that in mind. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So you got the bride of Christ and you got a whore. And uh, you know what? We, we should just go ahead and read this because it ties Egypt uh, in Exodus ties in with Revelation a lot. It really does. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman, a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, and scarlet color and decked 
with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And people will say, oh, yeah, these colors and all this stuff, this is the Vatican, this is the Catholic Church. Well, read the book of Leviticus. These are all the colors of the Levitical priesthood. Long before the Catholic Church existed. So, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Hmm. Blood of the saints, blood of the martyrs. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Hmm. And people that are preterists, they cannot read this stuff. They, you know, people that think everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, all the prophecies, and this is Christ's kingdom right now. See, they have to ignore the book of Revelation. They, they can't, they can't explain, well, they have to ignore it because they can't just, there's no way to explain it. I mean, the beast that was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, it isn't here yet. You know, Mark of the Beast, the two witnesses in Jerusalem, that didn't happen. None of that stuff's happened. So that's why they, preterists will, they'll always stick with Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and they avoid revelation like the plague. They have to. They can't. They can't do anything with it. So, but do you know that there's people whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? Yeah. Yeah. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. From the foundation of the world, when they beheld, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the whore, I'm sorry, on which the woman sitteth. And everybody say, oh, that's Rome, seven mountains. Well, yeah, Rome has seven mountains. I also heard Mecca has seven mountains. I don't know how true that is. Uh, Istanbul, which was Constantinople, which was the capital of the Eastern Orthodox Church at one time. Seven mountains. But it's now part of Turkey. You know, Ottoman, Muslim, Turks. Yeah. And Jerusalem is also seven hills, seven mountains. Yeah. But they also say, oh, Vatican City, Vatican City, Vatican City. Okay, well, whatever. Verse 9, And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the whole woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. 
These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Hmm. Verse 15. Let's take a look at the waters. The water. You know, W-A-T-E-R. Verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest. Now remember, this beast rose up out of the sea. The horse sits on many waters. The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth. So the waters you saw where the horse sits are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. Remember, Moses was drawn out of the water in Egypt. We'll get back to that. I'm going to read the rest of the chapter just to finish it off. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Oh, everybody, they'll tell you, oh, that's Rome. That's Rome. Uh, I don't think so, but yeah. All right, so let's take a look. All right, Exodus 2.10 again. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. So, he was drawn out of the water of Egypt. And let me tell you something. The Bible does not talk nice about Egypt. Egypt was inhabited by the children of Ham, um, Ham's not kosher, by the way. That's a joke. Um, a very poor one, but it's a joke. And um, he was the one of the three sons of Noah that came off the ark. Ham's area that he, he uh, inhabited are North Africa, parts of North Africa, and Ethiopia, and generally places where Christianity has never flourished. So let's take a look at uh, Ethiopia. Oh, I mean, well, Egypt. Now remember, um, let's see. Well, before we go to looking at Egypt. Let's take a look at, uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 9. I want to take a look and show you Ham. Um, yeah, we'll take a look. All right, the, the flood has already happened. Mo, uh, Noah had survived in the ark with his kids. And that's, uh, let's see. All right. Genesis 9, 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem. Shem is the uh, chosen seed. Were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Now Japheth was not the chosen seed, but Japheth would dwell with Shem. And if somebody from Shem married somebody in Japheth, they could be accepted into the fold. So, so, right, so you had Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And he, Canaan went and went to the land of Canaan, which he named after, you know, his descendants named after him. And he was the father of the Canaanites, which were the wicked, satanic human hybrids 
that nobody believes because they listen to demon nominational preachers instead of reading their Bible. Oh, my Bible, my, my Bible pastors, my, my church pastor says God loves everybody. Okay, well, don't read Malachi. No problem. I don't care. I really don't. I really don't care. I've had so many people disfellowship with me over uh, this thing. I don't care. I'll accept their apology one day. But uh, right now, I just don't care. So Ham is the father of Canaan. And the Bible doesn't say anything good about the Canaan and the Canaanites. Matter of fact, God says he's going to destroy the Canaanites one day. All right, so 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So the, the whole earth was before them. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Okay, what do you do with grapes? You make wine, right? And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. There's two ways to take this. One, oh, well, yeah, he was, uh, he was drunk and naked in his tent, and Ham looked at him. But when you look at the Bible, what it talks about, the naked, seeing the nakedness of your father, uh, it's talking about having sex with your mother or stepmother. And I'm not sure. Uh, I guess I better prove that point. What do you What do you say? All right, nakedness. I'm gonna. All right, Leviticus 18:10. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. Is it talking about undressing your kid's kid? Leviticus 20, 17. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see their nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his iniquity. Okay. Leviticus 18, 16. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Are you getting the idea here? Um, the naked uh, Leviticus 18 8 the nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover it is thy father's nakedness it could be a mother or a stepmother I'm thinking this is a stepmother Leviticus 18 11 the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father she is thy sister thou shalt not uncover her nakedness Um, I mean, you know, it, it's pretty, let's see, Leviticus 18, 17, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinsmen, it is wickedness. Hmm. Yeah. Leviticus 18.6 None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Are they talking about uh, seeing somebody undressing? No. No. That's... Uh, Hmm. Oh, here's a good one. Leviticus 20 and verse 21. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. 
He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Oh, how do you have children? Or, you know, oh, oh, you, you undress somebody and you look at them and yeah, you know, that's the kind of nonsense they teach in churches. Um, yeah. So you get the idea, right? And Ham, uh, Genesis 9.22 Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a, here's a clear, perfectly clear verse. Leviticus 20 and 11. And the man that lieth, and the man that lieth lies, you know, sexual. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Oh, but, but if you undress your father's wife, you know, uh, no. It's talking about having sex. I mean, this is the last two verses are plain as day. Have some spiritual discernment. Genesis 9.22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Okay. Uh, Verse 23, And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. I, you know, I don't think Ham looking at his dad was the sin here. I think Ham did Noah's wife, whether it was a stepmother or whatever. But, you know, sometimes you got to dig to understand what the Bible says. 24. And Noah awake, awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. Uh, and Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, Canaan was cursed by Noah. Now, I'm not sure, but is it? possible that Canaan was born from the union of Ham and his stepmother or mother or whatever. I don't know. So let's take a look. Uh, Egypt. Let's take a look at Egypt. Psalms 105.23 Israel also came into Egypt. And Jacob, remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. This is parallelism. Israel came into Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Israel is Jacob. Egypt is called the land of Ham. Psalms 105.27 they showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. Now they're talking about God's uh, plagues upon Egypt. That's what it's talking about here. Psalms 106.22 Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. What happened in the Red Sea? The, the army of Pharaoh was drowned, remember? Oh, yeah. So, let's see. All right, in Ezekiel 30 and verse 4, listen to what the Lord says about Egypt. And the sword, you know, war, and the sword shall come upon Egypt and great pain, great pain, shall be in Ethiopia, 
where the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her fountains shall be broken down. Uh, Jeremiah 43.12 And I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods, plural, a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captives, and he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd putteth on his garment, and he shall go forth from thence in peace. Uh, Egypt's probably most famous for the pyramids, right? And every country that you go to that has pyramids today, and there's pyramids all over the world. There's pyramids in South America, Central America, Mexico, China, uh, all over the place. Generally, they're uh, third world countries. And personally, I think the fallen angels taught mankind how to build the pyramids as a way to worship the fallen angels as gods. That's what I'm guessing. Oh, I wanted to point out something else too. If you were drunk, naked, and passed out, how in the world would you know one of your kids looked at you naked? I mean, come on, you know? And uh, did Ham rape his mother or his mother-in-law? Uh, you know, I don't know. But I mean, that sort of kind of makes sense. Uh, we don't even know who the, the, the wives are. Uh, Noah could have had uh, more, you know, more than, they, the, the children could have had different mothers. I mean, it doesn't, you know, maybe a mother died and he got remarried or I don't know. But we don't even know who the uh, mothers of uh, Shem or Japheth or Ham were. So, I don't know. Uh, just something to point out. All right. Does the Lord like Egypt? Jeremiah 43, 12. Um, and I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captives, and he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd putteth on his garment, and he shall go forth from thence in peace. Doesn't sound like the Lord likes Egypt. No. So, let's move on. Ezekiel 30:19 Thus I will execute judgments in Egypt and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now here's an interesting thing. Hosea minor prophet 11 and verse 1 When Israel was a child then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And that happened when Moses took Israel out of the land of Egypt. But something else, too. Remember when uh, Christ was born in Bethlehem and then Joseph had a dream? Take the child Jesus to uh, Egypt to escape Herod. And then after a certain amount of time, they came out of Egypt and returned to uh Let's see, where do they go to? They went to um, uh, Galilee, right? Nazareth. So, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Well, that was fulfilled with when Christ left Egypt to go back to uh, the land of Israel. Psalms 114 and verse 1. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language. So, and yeah, if you want to read the uh, parallel verse of Hosea 11.1, 1, that's in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19. And you can read the rest of it. Now, if you still wonder if the Lord likes Egypt, um, in Revelation 11, speaking of the two witnesses, verse 8, uh, the two witnesses that are killed by the beast, 
and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So when people say, oh, that well, that's Rome, that's, that's Vatican City. Uh, okay, so your Lord was crucified in Vatican City? Really? Rome? Oh, okay, well, what's his name? Because it's not Jesus. It cannot be Jesus because Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. And their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. See, all you got to do is use a little bit of logic and you can figure out, you know, the great city is going to be Jerusalem. You know, Satan wants to pollute everything that God ha is holy and righteous. And for the, the devil to rule from Jerusalem is going to be, and to set up a temple and do animal sacrifices, that's the ultimate blasphemy for what Christ did on the cross, is it not? Oh, no, it's going to be Vatican City. Uh, do you know there's three city-states? Vatican City is one of them. That is the counterfeit Christianity. Uh, Vatican City has its own, it's a, it's a city nation within a nation. The government of Italy has no jurisdiction over Vatican City. Do you know that Vatican City could take every priest that sodomized an altar boy, bring them to Vatican City, extradite them, and execute them? They could, without ever worrying about Italian law, but they don't. They are a city and a state. They are their own nation. What's another city-state? London. The city of London is a, it is the, uh, it's a, it, it's a, it's separate from England. It really is. So that is the financial center London was a financial center long before New York City. And what's the other city-state? Washington, D.C., District of Columbia. Why is it the District of Columbia? Who's Columbia? Uh, Columbia, she is the goddess. Yeah, the goddess, a female god. District of Columbia. Uh, there's a country that got named Columbia. Did the uh, people of Columbia decide to name their country Columbia, or did somebody name it for them? Yeah, I wonder about that. And I had to look this up. You know when Washington, D.C. got its name? September 9, 1791. So it wasn't originally known as the... District of Columbia. And they will tell you that it's the feminine form of Columbus. Uh, you know, for when he so-called discovered America. No, it's named after the goddess. You know, the Masonic goddess. I'll guarantee you that uh, the original founders, they didn't call it that. But... Uh, yeah. Let's see. What else? Oh, yeah. We got to keep going here. So, does the Lord love the ham? Oh, let's take a look. Second Chronicles 14.12 So, the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. I think Asa was a king. Uh... I'm not sure if he was a king of Israel or a king of Judah, but it doesn't matter. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. So the Lord struck them down. 
Zephaniah 2.12 Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. Doesn't sound like the Lord liked the Ethiopians too much. Huh, does it? No. Second Chronicles 14.13 And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. Yeah, I don't think the Lord likes Ethiopia or Egypt. No, doesn't sound like it, does it? All right, so Moses means to draw or to bring forth or, you know, take out of. And he was taken out of the water, out of the water of Egypt. You know, the waters that thou sawest are peoples, nations, languages, and tongues. Okay. So, what about Saul? You know, Saul, well, this is a study on Moses as opposed to Paul. Contrasts, similarities and contrasts, the differences. Similarities and differences, right? Saul, as he was originally known, in the Hebrew means prayed for or asked for. You know, you ask, A-S-K, you ask for something. Saul, huh, what is, why does that, you know, why, what, why would that mean ask for? What's the significance of that? Uh, now, the Apostle Paul was, had the same name as the king of, the first king, human king of Israel. Well, let me give you a little thing. Paul, Saul, who became Paul, his writings have a lot, a lot of warnings about the end times. I mean, a lot. And there's people who tell you, oh, Paul's writings don't belong in the Bible. He was a false apostle. So basically what they're telling you is that the Bible's wrong on the book of Acts because that's the book that tells you about Saul's conversion. They're going to tell you, well, logically, think about it. They want you to believe that the Holy Spirit failed, failed to warn the other apostles that Paul was a fake. I mean, because after all, uh, Paul went and talked to the other apostles and uh, they worked together. To, a, to an extent, you know, I mean, don't you think if Paul was a fake that it had been somewhere in the Bible where it says, uh, hey, Peter, Paul's a fake. Stay, you know, he's bad. Expose him. But it doesn't do that. No. So they want you to think the book of Acts is wrong. The Holy Spirit failed to warn the apostles that Paul was a fake. You, so they want you to throw away all of Paul's writings they want you to throw away 2 Peter that acknowledges that Paul was a brother in the faith. <laughs> you know, uh, well, you know, what were the books of Moses? Well, the, the, generally, everybody that I know of agrees that Moses authored Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible are called the books of Moses. Everybody agrees to that. Except for maybe Mormons or some off, off weird thing. All right, so if you want to get rid of Paul, Saul, Paul, uh, you got to get rid of the book of Acts. Well, let, yeah, you got to get rid of Acts. You got to get rid of Romans. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, let's see, what else? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 
First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and who wrote the book of Hebrews? I think I think Paul did, but I you know I can't prove it. So basically, if you get rid of all Paul's writings, you know what you're left with? You're left with Revelation, Jude, first, second, third, John, first Peter, James, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's it. That's the Bible to the Paul haters. I really think about it. Oh, Paul's a false apostle. Yeah, well, they're they're the false they're the false people. So all right, so let's read in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 1. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. They were the rulers. You know, not so much like a king, but rather like uh, like a judge. You know, I've got a, uh, a dispute with you. I'll present my case, you present your case, and then the judge makes a ruling. Uh, verse 2. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel. And the name of the second Abiah, they were judges in Beersheba. I wonder if that was Budweiser, right? And his sons walked not in his ways. So his sons did not walk in the ways of Samuel. Samuel was pretty much, overall, a pretty good guy. But turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Sounds like uh, sounds like they were exactly like today's politicians, doesn't it? They took bribes. Yeah, you got a rich guy that's hands you a pocket, a handful of cash. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to rule in your favor. I don't care what the other guy, you know. So they perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel under Ramah, and said unto him. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. You know, you're old, and your kids are not like you, Samuel. Your kids are bad news. We don't like them. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Make us a king. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want a king. We want an earthly king. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken, listen, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they shall say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee. No, 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 no. They didn't reject you, Samuel. But they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. Yeah, yeah. We want an earthly king. We don't want the Lord for our king. What? Are you people stupid? When, when Israel was going into the land fighting the Canaanites, God would throw down hailstones that you know weighed like a talent like like a millstone 70 pounds or 30 kilograms and you get hit in the head with one of them things and you're not going to feel like fighting anymore you, you, are you you people idiots really yeah they are we're, we're a bunch of stupid stiff-necked idiots and uh, I'm speaking from experience, personal first-hand experience with myself. Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they shall say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee. They haven't rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should reign, that I should not reign over them. See, they don't want God the Father to be their ruler and their king. No, 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 no. Verse 8 according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods 
and served other gods, so they also uh, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Oh yeah, you guys don't want the Lord for your uh, ruler? Well, I'm going to show you what your king's going to be like. Verse 10, And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. He's going to draft your kids, your sons, to fight in his wars. That's the Bob translation. Verse 12. And he will appoint him over him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest. Yeah, he's going to take your kids and make them his farmers and farm workers, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. He's They're going to be his blacksmiths and his craftsmen. Verse 13. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries. Uh, confectionary is like a fancy word for uh, makers of desserts, you know, like cakes and uh, Danish pastries, that kind of stuff. So he's, he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. So they're going to cook his food. They're going to bake his bread. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your cropland, your vineyards, your olive yards, the best of the best. He's not going to want the worst. He's going to want the best. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Oh yeah? When your kids get drafted and you don't see your kids anymore and I take all your land, I take your property and I tax you to death, don't cry to me. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to hear it. I'm going to stick my fingers in my ears and go, nah, 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 nah. Well, not exactly, but you get the idea. And ye shall cry out to me in that day because of the king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Oh, you know, our people rejected the Lord as king. You wonder why we got this, what's going on today? You know, with all the mandates and the medical uh mandated medical treatments that nobody half the people don't want uh, why your taxes are so high another possible war where your kids are going to get drafted and get killed why is all this happening well we didn't want we didn't want christ for our king no so god the father is going to say hey I'm going to let you have the other guy for your king. See how you like it. Yeah. And that's why we're getting what we're getting today. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, no, but we will have a king over us. We want an earthly king. That we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Wow. So you want a, a human earthly king to go out and fight your battles instead of God the Father. Really. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. 
And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. Oh yeah, if that's what they want, give it to them. Make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. All right, so let me give you the rest of the story here. Uh, who was the first king of Israel? His name was Saul. Ah, okay, what does Saul mean again? It means uh, prayed for or asked for. Huh, okay, didn't they ask for a king? Yeah, okay, and God gave him that. Saul was the first king. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul of Tarsus. What tribe was he of? Benjamin. Yeah. Huh. So are we seeing a connection here? And people say, oh, well, pfft, the Bible's just written by a bunch of guys that, you know, wanted to control people. And, you know, uh, it's, you know. I tell you what, if I had a thousand years of work on it, I don't think I could produce anything even close to the intricacies of the King James Bible. I, I, I couldn't do it. No way. Absolutely no way. But others want you to think that uh, all these coincidences are just, you know, well, coincidences, right? Now, what is Paul? You know, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he didn't want to be called Saul anymore. So he started calling himself Paul. Now, remember, Paul, uh, we'll, we'll probably go more into this later, but Paul was a, um, a Roman citizen, and that served him quite well when he was having trouble with the... Uh, the you know who's, yeah. Um, but Paul, from what I understand, is of Latin origin, and uh, Latin was the official la language of Rome, the Roman Empire, which was when Christ was around. Well, the Roman Empire had fairly recently taken control of the region from what had been the Greeks. So, uh, among in that area, Greek was the common language of commerce over the entire area. Latin was a fairly newcomer. But if you wanted to do official business with the government, chances are it was probably in Latin. Although I'm sure many of them spoke Greek. I mean, it was not uncommon for people to know two, three languages. Now, Paul was raised up as a Pharisee. I will guarantee you he could read the scriptures in Hebrew. He was a scholar. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. We'll probably go more into that. This is just kind of an introduction. Um, and when he was talking to the Roman soldiers, it is possible he was speaking to them in Greek, but my guess is he spoke to them in Latin. After all, he was a Roman citizen. Wouldn't you know the language, you know? I mean, only in America can you be an American citizen and not know the English language. I mean, go down to Miami or go down to L.A. You know, I was in L.A. in the 90s, late 90s. Do you know there was more Spanish radio stations than there were English ones? Yeah. Ah, uh, I was like, wow. So... Only in America can you be a U.S. citizen and not speak the language, English. I mean, really. But I'll guarantee you, Paul knew Hebrew. Paul, as a, a, a Roman citizen, probably had to have known Latin. And being that he went to all the Greek city-states, you know, Ephesus, Corinth, uh, Philippi, you know, these were cities in Greece, you know, Philippians, Ephesians, Corinthians. He had to have known Greek. Well, you know, the idiots 
want you to think, oh, well, Paul was speaking to them in Latin or Hebrew. Well, I mean, he might have in a synagogue, but you think he's going to be on Mars Hill speaking to them in anything other than Greek? I mean, when Jesus was crucified, what did Pilate put for the superscription? This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was in English. Uh, I'm sorry. It was in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, all three languages. Greek and Latin were. I mean, come on. Uh, Cleopatra of Egypt. Do you know she was Greek? Yeah. She was supposed to be one of the most beautiful women that ever lived. I bet you she was blonde. I bet you. Well, you know, if I'm right, I don't win the lotto or anything, but uh, the lottery. But I'm just saying, the uh, Greeks, Alexander the Great, the Greeks had conquered huge areas. And it wasn't until the, the kings were... Uh, Alexander's generals were fighting against each other that uh, Rome was actually able to rise up in power and take over the areas. You know, so, uh, you know, but um, when you conquer an area, the people are generally going to learn the language. That's just the way it is. That's why I think Miami's been conquered because, do you know, there's even government jobs. It's a requirement that you have to be able to speak Spanish. I mean, seriously. That was one of the reasons why I left Miami. I, a lot of jobs. Oh, must speak Spanish. Must be able to read and write Spanish. I was like, man, uh, I wonder if I went to Cuba, if they would uh, make uh, make the people learn English. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So what does Paul, what does Paul mean? You know, from Saul to Paul. In the Latin, Paul means small, little, or humble in Span uh, Latin. Small, little, or humble. Small in your own sight, little in your own sight, or humble. Paul, Saul of Tarsus killed Christians. When he became one, he says, I'm Paul. I'm now small, little, and humble. Think about that. So the first king of Israel was Saul. You know, you ask for a king, you got a king. And uh, actually, King Saul of uh, in... Um, of Israel, he actually started off pretty good. But uh, soon he got lifted up in pride. And next thing you know, he's trying to kill King David, future King David that slew Goliath. And, uh, and uh, he went and actually consulted with a witch, the witch at Endor. Isn't it funny how... Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen it, Bewitched, the TV show from the 60s, Elizabeth Montgomery. Uh, her mother was called Endora. Yeah, I used to watch that garbage. Not a lot, but I knew what it was. Endora. Think that's a coincidence? The witch at Endor? Endora? Feminine for, yeah. You know, they... Pfft. So... You know, so we, uh, and and where did Paul, you know, Paul, uh, so Moses came out of the Egypt. Paul came out of Jerusalem, which, believe it or not, Jerusalem is likened unto Babylon. And I think I'm going to prove that to you. Well, in the uh, book of Acts, it says the church at Babylon. Well, in the Old Testament, I forget if it's Isaiah or Ezekiel, 
or if it's Jeremiah. I think it's I think it's Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 34. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. But uh, Babylon was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. Destroyed. And the Lord said it would never be rebuilt. Never. Remember, uh, what's his name? Uh, in Iraq, Hussein tried to rebuild Babylon. And it didn't work out very well. That was a mistake on his part. So if Babylon was destroyed and the Lord prophesied it would never be rebuilt, uh, why would the, I think, I think it was Peter talking about the church at Babylon. It had to be Jerusalem because end time Jerusalem is definitely going to be Babylon. Because the Bible says that Babylon killed, in Revelation it says Babylon killed the prophets. Jesus said Jerusalem killed the prophets. Don't believe me? Revelation 18, 24, and in her, Babylon, and in her was found the blood of prophets, prophets, and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. So Babylon was responsible for the blood of the prophets. Revelation 16, 6. For they, Babylon, have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, and, has, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman, you know, the whore, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Babylon killed the prophets. So, Jesus explains to you who killed the prophets. Luke 13, 33. Jesus speaking. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 37. Jesus speaking. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Oh, but it's Rome, Chaplain Bob. Don't you know that? Uh, I think I'm going to believe Jesus over a uh, paid off Babylonian whore pastor. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How Often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And remember the two end time witnesses of God, Revelation 8, 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. When somebody tells you Rome, ask them what's the name of their Lord. And when they say Jesus, call him a liar because Jesus was not crucified in Rome or the Vatican. Hmm. Yeah. So, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, Paul writes, oh wait, oh, this is why they don't like Paul. Listen. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the you-know-whos. It's a J word. I'm being very cautious with tube. Even as they have of the you-know-whos, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets? It doesn't say Rome, does it? No. And have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Matthew 23, 34 and 35. Wherefore, I behold, I send unto you prophets 
and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your sin of Gog, plural, and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Who killed Abel? Cain? Unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barchias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Now, as I understand it, Zacharias was the son of John, the, I mean, the father of John the Baptist. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. Really, you think about it. You know, Mystery Babylon. So, all right, well, I think this is good for a introduction. I hope that I've uh, given you a good foundation. We're going to go more into the parallels between Moses and Paul. You know, Moses came down from the mountain having been giving the Ten Commandments on a tablets, a stone written by the finger of God himself, whereas Paul was given the new law. So, you know, we're going to take a look at that. And all these Torah so-called keepers, you know, people say, oh, well, we will, we got to keep Torah. That's why Paul's false. We got to keep Torah. We got to keep Torah. Uh, they're a bunch of liars and hypocrites. You know why I say that? Because if they were Torah keepers, they would fill their ro uh, pockets with rocks and go to San Francisco and empty their pockets. Yeah, because that's what the Torah says to do. But uh, they don't do that. No, no. They want they want you to keep the laws that they didn't keep in the days of Jesus. That's what they want. You know, Paul, Jesus said to the Pharisees, He says, "You know, all none of you, uh, all of you know the law, but none of you keep it. None of you keep the law. Don't tell me you do." You know, the woman taken in adultery. They wanted to stone the woman, but where's the guy? Where, where, where's the guy that was committing adultery with this woman? Where is he? You know, but, but you want to stone the woman? Wait a minute. It takes two people to commit adultery. Two. And they only brought half. You know, half a lie is still a lie. Or a half truth is, you know, yeah, you get the idea. I mean, where, where's the guy? You know, come on. Now we want to stone the woman. It's her fault. Yeah, the guy is just as guilty. Just as guilty. Why don't you go get the guy? That's probably what Jesus was writing in the sand. Why don't you get the guy and bring him here too? You know, but uh, I kind of suspect that uh, some of the guys that were uh, standing around wanting to stone this woman... I wonder if some of them had her. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, just speculation on my part. Don't, you know, don't listen. I'm just thinking out loud. So, all righty. Uh, so, you know, Saul changed his name to little or and small and humble. I mean, that's, you know, think about it. Saul was, Saul had a conversion in the book of Acts. The entire, you know, and people that deny Paul, they have to throw away the book of Acts because the book of Acts records Saul's conversion. You're going to tell me the Bible's been wrong for almost 2,000 years and all of a sudden these Paul haters are right and everybody for almost 2,000 years has been wrong? Really? Yeah, maybe the Paul haters are antichrist. That's, yeah. Yeah, we got to keep Torah. Well, when you start uh, loading up your car with rocks and heading towards San Francisco, I might believe you Torah keepers. But until then, 
You're a bunch of liars and hypocrites. So, all right, uh, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. Uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.